Well, hi, everybody. This is episode 513 of the Stable Scoop Show on the Horse Radio Network. It's our equestrian roundtable show. Our sponsors of this episode are Arena Saddles and you, our listeners. I am Glenn the Geek, founder of the Horse Radio Network and host of Horses in the Morning, the longest running daily horse podcast in the world. Welcome to the second Equestrian Roundtable on the Stable Scoop Podcast. In every roundtable, I invite two industry professionals and one listener to tackle the hot topics of the day in the horse world. I'll be your host and moderator, and I'm sure I will have opinions occasionally. I do have some, but mostly the panels panelists will lead the way. If you're watching live, welcome, and you can comment down below, and we wish we, you that you would comment to the topics we talk about tonight, and we'll try and reference those comments as we go along. It's one of the reasons that we're doing this show, combining live video and audio for the podcast feed later, and if you miss watching any of this live, you can catch the recording on the Stable Scoop podcast feed or any podcast player. Just look up Stable Scoop. You'll find it there. We're going to be live every other Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. And tonight, I am coming from our RV. We're at uh, Fort Wilderness at Disney World, and we came down last night. We're going to be here for three nights. We got to tour the barns today. They have a brand new barn here where they keep uh, some of the carriage horses and things. And Robin, from, who's the manager here at, uh, at Tricircle D Ranch, she gave us a tour, and we got to meet the cute little new white baby, the new white fall pony that's one of Cinderella's ponies. And we got, and I posted videos of that today on the Horses in the Morning uh, Facebook page. If you want to go there, she, this little baby is so, he's so darn cute. And a handful, apparently, born about two weeks ago. So we got to do that. You'll hear more about that on Monday's episode of Horses in the Morning. We'll talk about why they have a new barn and how freaking nice it is when you have a little bit of money to build a barn. It's uh, really nice. But we have some panelists tonight, so let's meet them right away. Tonight, joining us for this round table is host of the Certified Horseman. Association episode of the Horses in the Morning Show. We have Christy with us. Hi, Christy. How are you? Hello. Good. Look at you with your official backdrop. Yes, and it's not virtual. It's like the real thing. See? It oh, there. yeah, it is a real thing. <laughs> the real thing. Took it from our international conference and stuck it in my office. That's yeah. perfect. I need a backdrop like that. Instead, yeah. I have a camper window. <laughs> I like your camper window, too. <laughs> so uh, that's my backdrop. Let's. Uh, Christy, of course, has been hosting an episode of Horses in the Morning now for eight years. I don't know. A long time. It's been a long time. Yeah. yeah. One every of my month. favorite part of my jobs, Glenn. Well, we look forward to having you every month, and it's always educational and a lot of fun. So uh, th and you're what day of the month? I am the third Tuesday of every month. Third Tuesday of every month. If you go to horsesinthemorning.com, scroll down the middle of the page, you'll see a CHA banner. If you click on that, it'll bring up all her episodes there for the past uh, 25 years. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, one of the newest podcasts on the Horse Radio Network, the Humble Hoof Podcast. We have Alicia joining us. Let me bring her in. Hi, Alicia. Hello. And Alicia, you're, you have a palm tree in the background. Where are you at? Um, so I'm north of Boston, where actually we have a few inches of snow outside, but my husband thought this would be a nice background for people to see tonight. So yes, it is a good background and it makes you think warm thoughts. Right, exactly. <laughs> I'm actually quite warm. It's 80 degrees here in Florida today, so that'll make you all sick. That's right. <laughs> so, it can be 15 degrees here on Friday, so. Oh, that's fun. That's so much fun. Alicia, tell everybody a little bit about your podcast. Yeah, so my podcast is about the health of the hoof and uh, soundness of horses. So I interview vets and farriers around the world about different pathologies and ways to improve your horse's feet and their movement. And your your podcast is proving to be very popular with our auditor group. Everybody's oh, loving great. it. Yeah. Apparently, a lot of people like to nerd out over feet. I know, I do. So I don't blame them. <laughs> <laughs> and you are a farrier yourself, right? Yes. Yep. I, um, I see about 200 horses a month or so. Wow. How's your back? Um, it's, you know, I keep wondering when I'm going to break down and hoping it's not too soon, but I'm hanging in there. So good. Good. <laughs> yeah. good. All right. So our third panelist, we always have somebody that represents our whole listening audience. So there's no pressure there. And we have one of our terrific auditors tonight, a good friend of ours. She's a professional carriage company owner of Fantasia Carriage in Austin, Texas. And she has been on our cruises and everything. And we love her. Her name is Robin. Hi, Robin. Hi, everyone. So Robin's representing the listeners tonight. So if she messes up, 
you can blame her. That's, uh, you know, it's <laughs> no pressure, Robin. And we also have a whole bunch of listeners joining us. We have Danielle and Beth and Liam and Kat and Chrissy's here. Hi, Chrissy. Uh, Scott's here and a bunch of people's names I can't see because they're in our private room. Uh, but we're glad that you're here. So definitely comment as we get to our topics. And we're going to start with the first topic. We have three of them for you tonight. First topic, we're dealing with some tough ones tonight. We're going to talk about how to deal with difficult clients, no matter what part of the horse world you're in, uh, whether that's a boarder or you're a lesson person and it's a student or you're a farrier and it's, a, it's a, just an awful client. Uh, second thing we're going to deal with is animal rights and how they affect the horse world. That won't be controversial. Uh, and then the third one is the best way to find a trainer or a farrier or a vet, because we get that question a lot with our listeners. So we're going to tackle all three of those. We're going to give about 15 minutes to each. And we're going to start off with, and this was a listener that requested this. They said, based on a recent post, uh, could you comment on how to deal with difficult uh, clients, board, you know, boarders, passengers, and the need to balance income against maintaining one's sanity. Because isn't that what it's about? We're professionals in this business. We had a boarding stable for a long time. You need the income, but you also don't need the barn drama, right? And, and it seems like if you have more than five people, you're going to have one. There's always one. Uh, sometimes you get lucky and can have a barn full of 20 people and there's none. But a lot of times there's the one. So do, do you keep the one, you know, because you need the money or or not? So, Christy, I think this is a perfect one to start with the Certified Horsemanship Association. Every one of your members deals with this at some point or another. Yes, they sure do. And I guess if I was on horses in the morning, I would jokingly say fire them. Um, but <laughs> this is both the more serious show. So we have to go ahead and have a conversation about that. And yeah, the answer is it's complex right? Because the answer is, can you afford to let them go? And if you can't afford to let them go, your business model is a problem um, because you should have enough money in the bank and savings and enough other clients on a wait list that you can let the ones with drama go. Because what will happen is that the ones with drama will cause others to also leave. And then you'll really be in trouble if you don't let that one go. And we've seen this happen time and time again for instructors and trainers, um, just kind of the the whole variety. So that would be my two cents worth is it's probably better to let the one drama mama go than have a bunch of other people follow because you're not letting her go. Sometimes that drama person, uh, there's complications. As you said, it's not always easy because that person, one, has a large megaphone of some kind. You know, with social media today, that's tough where you're afraid about that person, person bad mouthing you or they're they are friends with a couple other people in the barn. And you're then now you lose one, you lose three or four, you know, so there's that. It's never as easy as just one person, is it? It sure isn't. And it just goes on and on and on with social media. And one of the things we say about social media, especially for people like in California where Yelp is king and they actually have restaurants after out there that say, please ask for help before you Yelp. So um, we kind of just tell everybody, you know, get 10 of your closest friends and call them up and don't take that comment off of your social media. Have 10 of your closest friends get on there and make the comments for you to that person so that you don't have to deal with it. And that's what we tell our people in this situation too. ask the other boarders to have a conversation with this border or ask the other, um, you know, or if it's a student, have maybe other students and maybe other students, parents have a conversation with the one that's giving you grief. And that might also help. Help um, soften that person instead of you looking like the bad guy as the professional. So that's great if you have a barn situation where the person's there all the time. But now Robin's dealing with a whole different world. You're dealing with a world where you don't know if your client's a jerk until you have them in your carriage. Uh, so, you know, how do you yeah. deal with the, the problem children that end up, uh, you know, at a wedding or whatever? Uh, so the first one that comes to mind, and thankfully I have not had that many. But the first major one was a groom that I hadn't even met because I was working with a wedding planner. And it was during one of those crazy Indian barats, but he wanted the carriage. So he wasn't on the horse. He was in the carriage. And when the music started, uh, he decided it was a perfectly acceptable to stand up on my velvet carriage seats and dance. And I'm... Turn. I mean, I feel the carriage just rocking and moving. And of course, it's not hooked up enough to the, I mean, it's so loosely connected to the horse that they don't care. Um, but he's just like, and I'm worried my carriage is going to fall apart because he's just having his own little self party back there. 
And I swear, if I had had the whip with me, <laughs> I would have reached back and like whacked him because it's like, I mean, why do people think that that is okay? I mean, no. So thankfully it was, I had to basically grin and bear it for about 15 minutes and then he got out finally. They they actually had to pull him out because he was like, I'm having too much fun. Um, but yeah, it, in, in my case, since I mainly do weddings, I only have to deal with it one time. And then it's not for very long. And, and it's like, as long as they're not hurting the horse, which is what came up the other weekend, is this group of kids was coming up and I was doing carriage rides at a quinceanera and this group of kids came up and they were young boys and they all were snickering and laughing and, and they said something about go, go and do it, go and do it. And I said, Oh, if you want to pet the horse, it's fine. You know, you, you're able to. And he's like, no, I want to smack it. <laughs> and I, I didn't have my filter turned on. So I said, well, if you smack my horse, I'm going to smack you. And I think he was. You need to start carrying your whip more often. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's hard when the horses don't need it. And then we'll get into that later. But a lunch whip, carry a lunch whip with a very long lash. (laughs) Yeah. Well, with I mean, with the draft horses, I carry a pretty long driving whip. Uh, And I could reach pretty far, but uh, I really would get in trouble if I actually hit somebody. I could just (laughs) wish that I would hit them. (laughs) You know, I think junior high age kids, though, especially little boys, it's legal to hit them with your whip. It's fine. (laughs) All raised by a community as other moms and dads would appreciate it. Yeah, exactly. You'll get thanked. (laughs) Well, actually, I mean, I... I don't know if it got back to their parents or not, but the lady that hired me gave me a five-star review on Google. So oh, there you go. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so Alicia, now you have a little different situation too. It's interesting tonight because we are all coming from a different way, right? You have a different situation in that you're, you're dealing with clients who you see over and over and, you know, every six weeks. Right. Um, and some of them are trouble. <laughs> some of them don't pay. You know, you have a variety of things. So what do you run into and how do you how do you handle it? Yeah, so I came to this career. um, I was a teacher in my past life for almost 10 years. And I left that job because I had been burnt out. And I was just I mean, I couldn't do it anymore. So going into this career, I already said to myself that life is short. We only have so many days and I don't want to spend a day dreading going to work. I don't want to wake up in the morning and dread going to a barn that I don't want to be at or see someone I don't want to see or see horses that I'm scared are going to hurt me or, you know, make it so that I I can't help more horses because I'm injured. So if I get a sense, usually you can sense in the first, in the first appointment, if it's not a good match, either personality wise or the horse is, dangerous. You know, obviously if a horse is in pain and they have trouble standing, that's a totally different scenario. Um, but I usually, you know, will say to someone, I might have a better professional for you that's able to meet your needs or, you know, I I don't know if we're going to be a good match because yeah, you're like you said, I see them every four to six weeks. And if I'm dreading their appointment coming up, it's, it's not worth it. I already went through almost 10 years of that, you know, so I'm, I'm probably a little bit, a little bit more on the fire you end, like Christy was saying earlier. Um, and it, what really struck me about the question that you originally asked was about balancing the bills portion of it, because I, like I said, I left a really secure career where I was getting a paycheck every two weeks with benefits and, and jumped into self-employment. And I wasn't sure if I was going to be making enough money to cover all my bills. We have a mortgage, you know, we have, I have a horse, I lease another horse. Um, And one thing I've found is building professional relationships with other farriers, other trainers, with veterinarians, you get to refer clients to each other that you know are clients that are going to be paying well and that are, you know, taking good care of their horses, taking, you know, good care of the people they work with and they're, they're good in a professional relationship. So 
sharing clients that way, you sort of know who you're getting and building those professional relationships with other professionals is, is great for doing that, for kind of getting those referrals. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, but that, that was really helpful for me. Do you have that? I know this years ago was a problem, maybe not so much anymore. Do you have the non-payer issue or the very slow payer issue as much as we used to? Um, you know, so I personally don't, I have, you know, maybe a handful of clients that will pay me maybe a week later after I'm there. And I keep a, a list of unpaid invoices. Um, knock on wood, I haven't had that many issues with it, but I have farrier friends who have outstanding bills for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Um, that some of them, they assume they'll never, they'll never see the money, but I've been lucky that I haven't had that issue. That's good. I think it also, it, it, the reason you haven't had that issue is because you haven't allowed it to be an issue. Yeah. I, yeah. I, like I said, I, you get to know someone when you're seeing them every few weeks. If, if it's somebody that I don't think I'm going to mesh well with, I usually um, tell them I'm not going to be able to work with them. <sighs> yeah. And usually the trick is when you first go, you're like, okay, this is how it's going to be. You're, you're going to, I'm going to do the work and you're going to pay me and this is how much it is. And then you set a precedent of, okay, this is the process we do. And no, you're not going to pay me a couple weeks later because when am I going to see the money? Um, that's one of the things that other carriage companies have asked me. And it's like, um, I won't go to a job if, unless I've been paid because I can't guarantee that I'm going to do all that work and they're going to actually pay me like they said, because yeah, it doesn't work that way. So setting when setting it the way it should be when you first start out is, is the ideal thing. Yeah. As long as you set the expectation and you know what the expectation is, then there's no question. Right. And if right. they don't meet the expectation, you're not going to do the job. And in your case, it's paying the bill. Right. So, yeah, uh, you know, I, I see that Marie joined us and said, well, I'm tuning in when Glenn's talking about whipping boys. So <laughs> Hi, me. Yeah. Hi, Marie. You can always count on Marie. <laughs> so, Christy, do you have anything to add to that conversation? Just, yeah, just the fact of, um, and going back maybe a little bit, um, not to the pain issue, but just to the issue in general, it's kind of like when you hire and fire somebody, right? So, the whole three strikes, you're out thing. So, keep a folder on them. Go ahead and have a conversation with that bad boarder or bad client and just kind of say, hey, these are some of the issues that are happening. Here's your chance to resolve it. Otherwise, here are your consequences. And then the second time, go and say the same thing. And then the third time, say, well, guess what? Just like if you worked for me, because um, technically, you know, I work for you. But in this situation, you are really causing whatever havoc it is. And so now we got to let you go. So that whole three strikes, you're out thing, um, I think, helps and keeps you looking very professional. Yeah. We, uh, actually, um, sorry, real quick. Um, just when you said that, Christy, it made me think of this and not a client, but actually a planner that I used to try to work with that was extremely hard to work with. I mean, and the guy would show up at the wedding in sweatpants oh. and I'd have to like chase him down to get the contract signed. And it's like, it's just not worth the heartache to, and, and, and the stress to, to work with this person. So then every time he'd call me and ask me if I was available, I was no, sorry, not available that day. We're going to have to move on to the second question. One of the things that I was taught early in my sales training when I was doing sales for years and years and years, and then I taught uh, when I was teaching sales, is I learned, and this is the best piece of advice I ever had, is fire your worst client every year and you'll increase your income 20% the next year. Okay. And so every year I would I would take my worst client, the one that Alicia said that you just dread, you don't want to go to their house. It's just, you dread it, you know, and you know who that is. You just know who it is. Uh, and or, you know, if you're working at a business, there's always the one person in the office that you dread seeing and try and avoid. Right. So um, so we so that's a, if you're in business, fire your worst client every year. And usually that client's not one of your big clients. It's usually one of your smaller clients that bring in very little income, but take up 20 percent of your time. So the reason that firing that person is it, it creates 20 percent more time for you to make that 20 percent income increase. So that's 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 a piece of advice that I had from my sales training all those years ago. Let's hear, though, about uh, our sponsor before we get to the second question of the night. We're going to go into 
animal rights activists. That should be fun. Robin deals with that a little bit. And we all will eventually. But I wanted to talk to you about arena saddles. They're perfect in any arena. Arena saddles are available in dressage, jumping, and all-purpose models, all classically crafted from beautiful European leather. With meticulous attention to detail, you will turn heads in any arena with the confidence that your saddle is comfortable for you and your horse. Whether you're nailing your canter transition at sea, perfecting a five-stride line in a three-foot division, or galloping the countryside with wild abandon, there is a perfect arena saddle for you. Go to arenasaddles.com to learn more and to find a retailer. That's arenasaddles.com. And we thank them for their support of the roundtable. All right, let's get to question number two, guys. And Robin, I'm going to have you explain this question. You brought this to the table. Yeah, so um, animal rights. Uh, The carriage industry is dealing with it a lot, as we all know, back when the New York City carriage issue was going on. And um, I know, Glenn, anytime you'd touch on it on your shows, you would say, you know, sure, it's with the carriage industry now, but you guys that think it's not going to affect you, it will. Um, and, and we are starting to see that it is. And um, so I think one of the most important things before we get into details about talking about the ways it's affected the carriage industry and other horse related events is let's let everybody know what animal rights is. And Christy, with your resources, you found a really good um, definition. So go ahead and share that with everybody. Sure. So this was from um, Cindy Schoenholtz. She's the former uh, Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association (laughs) Animal Welfare Director. So she was dealing with it quite a bit. Um, And she says that animal rights is a philosophy that animals have rights equal to those of humans. Animal rights extremists reject the use of animals for any purpose, regardless of treatment. They equate use with abuse. And then on the other side, animal welfare, a belief system that we have the right to interact with animals in industry, sport, recreation, and entertainment. But along with that right comes the responsibility to provide proper care and handling. And I think we all agree with number two, right? I mean, we all agree with that. That's why we're here. And if you've listened to any of our shows, you'll know that we all agree with that. That's that's what we preach and teach every day, right? Um, but, and, and you're right, Robin. And I think it was about 10 years ago. I said, I did say that slippery slope thing. And I said, you know, it's first the carriages, then it's going to be racing. And then it's fox hunting. Fox hunting's always been dealing with it for a long time. Um, and then racing and, and it just is going to, then it's going to be eventing and then it's going to be, ro- obviously rodeo has been dealing with it too. So it is a slippery slope. They don't want us using our horses for anything. They want us, they don't really don't certain group of them don't even want us owning horses in the first place right um, right you know so there's that but you've been dealing with it on the carriage side and and let's also be honest and upfront about this there are crappy horse people that treat their horses like crap and yeah. you know but i believe it's a minority just like anything else a minority ruins it for the majority uh so robin it's the same in the carriage world there are crappy carriage operators you know yeah. and Yes, there we're going to give that we're going to give that that there are those out there. We are and but that's where animal welfare comes in because you know if they're out there on the streets for too long or in too hot a weather or too cold a weather or their harness isn't fitting right all of that fits under what animal welfare believes whereas animal rights think that just because I mean Thankfully, with how I do special events only, um, I've only had to deal with protesters one time. And it was when a big business like a mall hired me to give rides for weekends in a row uh, around Christmas time. And uh, so I only had to deal with one set of protesters. But they were saying they were claiming that and they were screaming at the top of their lungs, holding the signs and everything. Thankfully, they were keeping respectful distance from the horse, which I have seen video footage of them not doing. uh, But they were claiming that the bit in my horse's mouth was cruel. All horse, I mean, very, I mean, there are people that ride without bits. Yes. But I'd say 85% or more uh, disciplines use a bit. So that would affect everybody that rides a horse. Um, the uh, the fact that 
my horse was uh, malnourished. And this was my tubby horse that you can't see any ribs on. And they were saying that I was being abusive. And all she was doing was standing there with her harness on. And for people that don't drive, the on a four-wheel carriage, the only weight that is on the horse is the harness, which is lighter than a saddle, and the shafts. So that's all they use to steer the carriage. That's the only weight on them. And the rest of the weight is on the carriage four wheels. And so the fact that they were complaining, I mean, carriage driving is, would you agree, Glenn, probably one of the easiest things a horse can do? Yeah. In yeah, definitely. all the disciplines. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they, they have to walk. <laughs> They have to walk and they have to pull a wheeled carriage, which, by the way, we can pull by ourselves. If, you exactly. know, it's, it's exactly. <laughs> you know, it's... My my thirteen year old daughter and I roll our big wedding carriage up a ramp into our trailer by hand. Yeah. And so it's like uh, this isn't hard for a horse that weighs one ton. You know, uh, it's perception, right? So if you look, it's visual. Right. So you see a yeah. carriage horse and it's visual. They're pulling the great big carriage with all those people in it. And, and it's a visual thing. So it's an easy thing. Plus, you yes. tend to, the carriages tend to be in a more urban area yep. uh, so that they're yep. visual that way, too. Whereas we're doing yep. our thing out in the country where nobody sees it. Uh, exactly. So the fact that exactly. they can see it is part of the is part of the issue, too. Exactly. There. Yes. And, yeah. and the the thing that I have noticed with animal rights versus animal welfare is animal rights people we tried to talk to them and they were completely against any any education whatsoever the person i was with because i always do a job with a second person on the ground she's a path certified instructor she was trying to educate them on why no the bit is not hurting those in any way here let me show you and they're like no I mean, and they're shouting it all, you know, we were in an apartment. So everybody was coming out on their balconies to come listen to these people spread lies about my horse and the fact that I was abusing my horse because she was standing there with a bit in her mouth. And, mm. and that same horse, the reason I got her is because the company that used to own her was run out of business by animal rights. And so they had to sell all their horses and their carriages and everything. And I ended up getting my horse diva. Um, but uh, things I've seen on social media where people have shared, like in the carriage groups, people have shared their personal experiences. Um, animal rights people were claiming a person was working a horse carriage rides with a broken leg. They show us a picture of the horse's broken leg. It was resting its foot. Yeah, standing there resting one foot. Yeah, that's a common How one. They always put that one out there. Yeah. Rest feet yeah. when they're out, you know. And that's a good thing. Hey Christy, do you agree <laughs> oh. with the sli- do you agree with the slippery slope thing? Christy? Um, I do. My I, I guess my problem is this is that I am an educator and education is key. And if people can't be educated, it's just irritating. Um, <laughs> However, with that being said, I there's a pull quote for tonight's show <laughs> right there. <laughs> but I just think that your people that haven't gone to the extreme route of animal rights just don't understand and can be educated. And we have to be vocal. I think so many of us in the horse industry just mind our P's and Q's. We just go in the backyard. We go to our barn. We do our thing. And we're not loud. And the rights activists are loud. So guess what? We have to be loud, too. And I think that we need to be more loud in public venues to be able to educate the masses and say these horses are not being hurt. I was at Balti Nationals in Denver and I um, that's open to the public and in walks a family and the mom instantly said, oh, I don't like this. There's a big whip. The horse's head is tied down and I could see where it was going. So in my best educating way I can with a smile, I said, would you like to learn a little bit more about this sport and what's all going on? And it could have gone both ways. They could have said no, nah. but she didn't. She said, I would love to learn more. So we educated about it's an extension of our arm is the whip. And actually, when you tie down a horse's head, the endorphins that go to their brain 
and calm the horse down, their flight animals, you know, all the things that we say. And at the end of it, she was like, we're staying. They ended up buying vaulting t-shirts for both of their girls. I mean, it was just great. So if we can educate I think that that's a huge deal. We had this one more example. Um, an old horse lived across the street and animal control was called a lot because we've been encroached upon where I live. And we have a lot of city dwellers now out here in the country. And those of us that are still on the 10 acre properties, you know, now with the thoroughfare that goes through our front yard, you know, all that have to deal with the people that don't know. And they were really concerned about this old horse. And I invited the animal control officer in for a cup of coffee. And I said, are you a dog cat guy? And he goes, I am a dog cat guy. Does it show? And I go, no, most of you are dog cat guys, right? You're not called out in this general area of Denver. I mean, we're a huge city to do anything with the horses. And he goes, we are not. So I gave him a body condition score chart. We had a conversation of one to eight. We had a conversation about Charlie, the 32 year old thoroughbred that lives across the street. And why he's a body condition score of like three, yet he gets so much good food and so much good care. And it's like the little old lady, right? And once I explained that to him, every single call that happened afterwards for my neighbor and her old horse was stopped by the same yeah. officer. So education, if we can, for those that aren't yeah. un able to be educated. Yeah, I actually have a friend that's trying really, really hard to get a uh, program off the ground where Horse people go into schools, of course, this was pre-COVID, um, to educate the kids on what is the difference. Because when they're an adult, they're already shut off that part of their brain that allows them to, you know, maybe my friend that told me this is wrong and I should learn myself. Because not everybody does that. They just parrot whatever else they hear. And so she's trying really hard to get a, a program started where uh, we can, she's got um, material that we can take into schools and present to the teachers or the kids or even hold our own programs at the barn where we can educate the kids on the difference. <clears throat> Alicia, any thoughts? Yeah, I was just thinking, especially while Christy was talking about how loud these activists are, is that like the word propaganda just keeps coming up in my brain about how you see like there's a Facebook post about something like a, you know, carriage driving. And then all of a sudden it's shared by all these people who aren't even horse people or who have no idea what the situation is. And it's like this propaganda to build up their case. Right. But, you know, a lot of us. I mean, I'm guilty too, or kind of like, oh, well, we're not even going to get into the drama on social media because, you know, it, it's sad when it, when you get to the point where listening to somebody else is a skill that you need to like learn. I mean, I feel like not all adults have that skill. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it is important that I think that we should be educating more. We should be speaking out more and trying to make people understand that propaganda isn't the truth necessarily. So yeah, I, like I got to bring up something though. I'm going to go to the other side. I'm going to, I'm going to go, we're in court and I'm going to take the other side for a little bit. In some cases we make it easy for them because we allow that minority in our discipline to get away with the bad things, whatever the bad things are in that discipline. And we all know those people and every discipline has the bad trainers and the cruel trainers and every discipline has it. We all have it. It's not unique to rodeo. It's not unique to Western or English. It's, it's everywhere. But we allow them to get away with that, which makes it easy and racing. For God's sake. I mean, we were uh, racing was a big billboard saying we kill horses in California on the track every day and we don't do anything about it. So and, you know, of course, they're going to pick that up because it's easy if we don't make it easy for them. And if we kind of do more self-policing, I think we have failed miserably as an industry in self-policing. I think yeah. because we want the ribbons, we want the money, we want we want the oh, um, hold on one second. <laughs> I have to get my plug in my computer. It's going to die. <laughs> well, that is important. Talk about well, while you're plugging in your computer, I, I don't mind jumping in again because I think this topic is, I'm very passionate about this topic. Um, just like Robin is, I think um, it's, 
behind behind the barn training, you know, I'm just going to hit it with a two by four. That all definitely has to go away. And the whole concept of judges um, wanting their horses to four beat in a Western lope when they really should do a true three beat lope, yep. right? You've got to fix the judging in order to be able to fix the trainers who are just training the client's horse in order to win the ribbon, right? So it goes very deep. And I would agree with you 100%. <clears throat> And I will say like a domino effect. Yeah. And I will say that one thing that might be not good necessarily, but it is, if it's truly shining a light on an industry, then maybe it's making those ones who aren't doing such a good job, uh, making them want to step up or making them either have to leave the industry because they aren't doing a good job. Um, but if we're, they're trying to be above reproach, if they're getting that light shown, shown on them, then others are either seeing that they're, they are doing okay, or the ones that aren't doing okay are are leaving or getting called out. So I guess it's not all terrible, but yeah, I agree that there needs to be higher standards and people need to, we need to ask for more. Yeah. And it, I mean, the thing with change, like changing for the better is, I mean, just think about how long it has taken for the big lick horses to get not as popular, but people still do it. And it's stuff like that that brings to attention, you know, there's a use thing on and we we try to change it. But there's so many people that think it's OK because that's the way it's always been done. So it, it's it's like. Pushing a cannon up an uphill slope, I mean, <laughs> um, trying trying to get people to do the right thing, even though they might lose. And I wish it wasn't so important for people to just only win. Uh, I wish they wouldn't put the horse's well-being below that. Very much so. Uh-oh. We lost Glenn. <laughs> so what does that mean? Can people still hear and see us in the comments? Does anybody want to go ahead and comment if you can still see and hear us? It says we're still live. Yeah, I think we're still alive. Okay. Let's just continue until he gets back. And Sounds we'll good to me. What happens? Okay. So, um, oh, he's back. We're just going to go on without you. We were carrying on. I guess you were still on because uh, it's, it hasn't ended yet. No, <laughs> yeah. we have our commenters saying that we are still on. So there you go. Okay. So now you know. If you go away, we can talk amongst ourselves. No problem. I'll go and you guys have fun. <laughs> no. <laughs> that is not fair. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. I think we lost our, our Disney internet conked out for a second and then I was back. So uh, I was just going to say, can you imagine what a company like Disney goes through having horses and having carriage rides with Cinderella yeah. carriages and everything? And yeah. you can tell, I mean, you know, I know them here and they're very careful. And of course, you know, what they don't realize is these horses are the best fed horses in the freaking world. I mean, they get to the top of everything. Right. <laughs> Yeah, you wish you you wish your kids were fed this good. Uh, now, the, um, the the protesters that I had to deal with at that one um, that one mall area was by the time I was finished with my long seven minute ride around the block, they were gone. And I was told by my person on the ground that it was because they were technically on private property, and the. Mm. Cards came and said, if you want to protest, that's fine, but you have to stand in the street. And they weren't willing to do that. So I wonder if Disney actually gets any like actual protesters because they're, I would think they'd be private property. property. Yeah, that yeah. happened to us when I worked at Medieval Times in Buena Park, California years ago as a stable wench was my official title, uh, <laughs> grooming the horses and things. Um, we could not, the protesters were not allowed. If we had any, which I was never there when they did, but they said there were some, they had to stand on Beach Boulevard in Southern California, which is like a six lane highway. So it didn't happen very often. Um, so I bet that that is a big part of it. All right, we should do all our shows in the middle of a the highway there. That solved the problem. We won't have <laughs> there you go. That we're good. <laughs> I'll tell you what PRCA did, which I thought was so wise of them. They looked at all their um, kind of surveys coming in of what the public didn't like. And the public didn't like calf roping the most because of when the rope went around the calf's neck and the cowboy had to jerk back, right? So now if you watch any rodeo on ESPN, they've taken that part out. 
And that was a decision that they made throughout the company. They said, we are not going to show the rope around the neck and the jerk. We're only going to show the rope going. And then we're going to show the cowboy jumping off and tying the legs and putting his hands in the air. So that's interesting. I'm not saying whether that's good, bad or indifferent. I'm just throwing that out there as a comment of sometimes if you change the way media portrays you, that can also be interesting with this topic. All right. Well, that's it. That's all the time we have for that topic. So uh, we're going to move on to the next topic. But first, I want you guys and the next topic is going to be how do you find a a new trainer, a new fairy or a new vet? We get that question all the time from listeners. So I think it's a good one to tackle. Uh, Alicia, we're going to be starting with you on that one, because it's finding a new farrier is the most common one of, (laughs) of all of them. But first, I want to I want you guys to talk a little bit about what you do. So, Christy, tell us a little bit about the CHA real quick. Yes. So for those that don't know, we're the largest certifying body of riding instructors and equine facility managers in North America. It is voluntary here to be certified, whereas over in Europe, it's mandated by federal law. So um, we're a 501c3 not for profit. And if you go on our website, CHA.horse, you can get certified. You can become site accredited. Um, or you can find a accredited site near you or an instructor or barn manager who's gone through our program near you. Thank you. And we'll go to Alicia next. Yeah, so I'm a hoof care provider in Northeast Massachusetts. And um, like I mentioned earlier, I switched careers from teaching to this because my horse actually had lameness issues. And so it sent me on a quest for education, which gave birth to a podcast. So uh, I do the Humble Hoof podcast twice a month through Horse Radio Network. And I interview, you know, like I said, vets and farriers around the world to basically bolster my own education and in turn, um, give others a way to learn more about how they can help their horses hooves and their soundness. Um, yeah. And as a host, it's, it's interesting because I do get asked that question a lot as a host, we learn more than anybody. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And it's sometimes the conversation we have after the show's over before the show starts that conversation that we have, that's not on the air where we really learn. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Your show's great. Everybody should take a listen to it. They can find it on any podcast player or on the Horse Radio Network app, either any one of those. And if you're in Texas and you're getting married or you're having a barat or you're you're, uh, whatever you need a carriage for, then you can go to Fantasia. Yeah, so um, my name is Robin Donahue, of course. And as Glenn said, I have a horse-drawn carriage business. I only do special events, so I'm not having my horses on the uh, streets of downtown Austin as tour guide. Uh, we do go downtown just for weddings. So they're only on the streets about uh, a maximum of two hours. And then they get to be ponies, uh, natural ponies the rest of the time. Uh, I also do crazy barats. Those are Indian wedding um, uh, parades, basically. Uh, for events. The- <laughs> uh, Glenn really wants to attend one. So I do. To visit in 2022, we are going to line it up so he can attend a barat with me. I have to do that. <laughs> um, yeah. So despite the fact that they are pretty insane, and I think an animal rights activist would have a cow seeing my <laughs> that one. Uh, I've had my big horse that uh, my auditor friend Lynn helped me pick out, Josie, has actually fallen asleep during one. So they aren't actually that stressful for the horse. Uh, But all they do, it's basically a glorified pony ride. And so those are a lot of fun. And uh, so, yeah, if you're uh, getting married, hit me up. Yeah, and uh, look up Barat on YouTube, and uh, you'll, <laughs> you can, can, it is a, it is wild. Imagine Mardi Gras for a for a uh, Indian yeah. wedding. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, it's 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 something else. All right, let's tackle the last question. And Alicia, so the question always is, how do I find a new farrier? My farrier fired me, or I fired my farrier, or they moved. Or, a lot of times, it's retired because farriers' backs give out um, when they're like twenty two. So. Um, what do you do? Yeah. I, so I'm in a really horsey area. So there are a million professionals, whether it's veterinarians, um, farriers, trainers, uh, barns, boarding facilities. So there, I mean, literally on the street that I live on, I think there's something like 15 barns. Um, so there, it's such a horsey area that you could literally turn to your neighbor and ask them, what veterinarian do you use? What farrier do you use? And they'll tell you a different name, most likely. Um, so you could build this, you know, 
great long list of professionals. I know that's not true everywhere. I know there's areas that are more remote. Um, but in, in my area, I think it's not so much finding a name of a farrier or a veterinarian or a trainer because there are so many. It's more, how do you find the one that's going to work for you and match your personality, match your style, be good for what you want for your horse? Um, match and, your pocketbook. Let me throw that in <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> that too. It's true. Um, so in that sense, you, you know, owners might have to do some education themselves of, you know, what do they want in a trainer? What do they want in a vet? What are they looking for in a farrier? Um, what kind of approach do they want for their horse? Do they want their horse um, to go, you know, jump four foot fences tomorrow? Or do they want, do they, does their horse need some kind of like physical therapy for their feet to get stronger? Um, do they want a trainer that's going to try to take them to the Olympics? Or do they want a trainer that's just going to get them more balanced in the saddle in their backyard? So if you know what you want for your horse and yourself, then you're able to go to a professional with an educated opinion of, you know, what you're looking for and have a real discussion with them. And then you can see if that's something that's going to match what you need. Um, because something that you want and desire might not be what your best friend does with their horse either. So, um, I think a lot of it, it's almost like a dating relationship, right? Like you need to know what you want before you go look for what you want. Um, so I, I and not all of them work out. Just right. Like they're, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> you don't always. And, and I'm in an area where luckily if something doesn't work out, then usually there's someone else who <laughs> you can turn to. But uh, if you're in a more remote area, um, there's a lot of different organizations. Yeah, there's a lot of different organizations that you can look to. I know for farriers specifically, um, there's everything from the IAPF, International um, Amer or International Association of Professional Farriers, the AFA. Um, I'm a part of uh, PHCP, which is Progressive Hoof Care Practitioners. Um, there's a bunch of different resources where you can go to their websites. Um, ELPO is another one, Equine Lameness Prevention Organization and find these professionals, find their names. And even if there's no one that seems like they're in their area, if you find someone that's the closest to you, even if they're three hours away, four hours away and contact them, they might know someone who's kind of, you know, under the radar in your area who does a really great job. I know I'm talking about farriers specifically, but, uh, you know, use those resources. I'm so thankful for these organizations that have these you know, great accountability for professionals um, all over the country and the world, really. And I'm sure they're similar for trainers like the CHA or or um, I know vets have different organizations they can be a part of, NEAEP, uh, AAEP. There's a, a handful of different organizations they can be a part of. So. so, Christy, one of the things, too, that I think people fall down on is they don't interview they don't do enough interviewing when they're going looking for a new trainer. And, you know, they don't they just think they can't ask all the questions when they should be asking all the questions. Yes. And one of the things that I would highly recommend is ask the riding instructor um, to be able to come and watch their lesson in action, whether they teach private, semi-private or group, say, can I just watch one one day? And if they say no, run away. And then in regards to a trainer, well, can I come out when you're training a horse that maybe has a similar issue to mine? Let's say mine, you know, kicks out to the leg at canter. Do you have any other horses like that? Great. Can I come and watch you interact? And again, if the trainer says no, well, then run away, right? What are they hiding? And then finally, with a boarding barn, can I come and uh, check out your boarding barn when there's a lot of activity? Not when it's all calm and wonderful at 7 a.m. and the horses are munching. No. Can I come and see your bo boarding barn at 3 in the afternoon on a Saturday when everything's going wild? And I can actually say, Woo, do I want to be with all this energy with my horse or do I not want to be with all this energy um, if you're going to a really you know, highly public boarding barn? So seeing it in action. And if they ever tell you no, then that, of course, is a red flag. Robin, you have anything to add to that? I'm looking for a trainer. <laughs> <laughs> You're a driver, though, and they're harder to find because there's so few and far between. Yeah, the, the, the driving trainer that I go to is over four hours from me. Yeah. So I don't go to him anymore, and um, I see him periodically at a show and ask him a few questions real quick. <laughs> But um, thankfully, all my horses are really well trained. And so I don't need 
a trainer for my horses because I always buy them where they've already have experience. I don't know what I would do if I had to train one myself for what I do. Um, but I'd like to find somebody for my daughter who really wants to learn how to ride. And none of my horses are really um, good for that type of, I mean, I could teach her, but my horses aren't up to par for what I need. And so I'm actually would love to find somebody that uh, can provide the horse and the knowledge. It's not always the best for a parent (laughs) to teach the kid at certain things either. It's It's hard. hard. Yeah, it's, Robin, it's just like when Jennifer tried to give me lessons on riding early on. Didn't go well. Didn't go well. <laughs> no, I teach them enough with the homeschooling. I think they're probably sick of me. Yeah, they're yeah. They're like, you already tell me, tell us enough. I don't want to hear any more from you. <laughs> <laughs> so anything else to add to this conversation, guys? I think, we, you know, what you and we always had this trick and I know that some people hate this. Uh, is when we were going to look at a horse or if we go, if you go look at boarding or whatever, we always showed up 15 to 20 minutes before the allotted time yeah. because then the horse wasn't tacked up yet and, or, yes. you know, they weren't quite ready. They haven't cleaned everything yet or whatever. Uh, you know, what are they going to do? Kick you out because you showed up early. Right. Uh, but, you know, you always see what's going on if you show up a little early. It's true. Uh, you know, I know yeah. it's kind of sneaky and some people that show horses hate that, but, you know, Whatever. If they're not hiding anything, it shouldn't be a problem, right? And Christy, there's a list of trainers and things on your website. Yeah, I was going to say Robin, CHA.horse. Yeah, so go to CHA.horse. And um, all of us have school horses. It's a prereq. We have to have school horses um, because we believe that that's a great way to learn. So yes, there's quite a few on there. But just kind of overall, you know, come with a mentality of buyer beware, right? Come with a mentality of just because they're first on Google when you put them in uh, doesn't mean (laughs) they're best. So really ask questions and um, really make sure that you ask other people that might be friends or family that are in the horse industry in one way or another, even if they own one and things, you know, the networking I think is just great. And yeah, that's yeah. I know really helped Alicia with her clients. Um, and I'm also a riding instructor and it's really helped me with mine, you know, networking. Yeah. And that's one thing I, I come across a lot when I am like just periodically look online for a, a riding instructor is everybody in this area is Western and it's like, I don't want a backyard uh, Western rider. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but that's not what my daughter wants to learn. She wants to learn how to jump. And it's like, well, we need somebody that can like go over the posting and have a horse that has a forward trot. So she can post and all that stuff. So time to move. Time to move. <laughs> <laughs> Not after we just built our big barn. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, Christy, uh, let's wrap it up. Tell everybody again, it's CHA.horse. Yes, yeah, CHA.horse for Certified Horsemanship Association. And you can find a lot of education on there too. Webinars, free videos, everything for the horse owner. So come check it out. And if you want to hear about horses' feet and all the uh, gory things that can happen to them, then you uh, go to Alicia because she talks about all that stuff. Yes. And I also have a website, thehumblehoof.com. Uh, but you can hear the Humble Hoof podcast on any podcast app or on Horse Radio Network. And of course, Robin, you can find the carriage company where? Fantasiacarriage.com. Or you can hit me up in the auditor room, but you have to be an auditor first. And how do they do that, Glenn? <laughs> Good Good setup. That was perfect. Uh, So (laughs) auditors are like the super fans of Horse Radio Network, and they pay uh, as little as $3 a month to join the group. And I would say our auditor page is probably one of the most active, positive places on Facebook. And a lot of auditors only belong to Facebook to be on that page. And we do a lot of stuff specifically for the auditors. We we do extra content for them. So, um, so yeah, you can do that by going to horseradionetwork.com and clicking on the auditor banner right there and speaking of that uh if you missed any part of tonight's live show you can go to the stable scoop feed and just search for stable scoop on any podcast player it's the oldest show on the horse radio network 12 years old uh and we will have the whole thing there in audio form if you want to take a listen to it we're here every two weeks on a wednesday night at 7 30 eastern time and you can watch it live it's a lot of fun to watch live there have been uh, about 40 people in and out tonight 
Uh, and we love to see the comments. Uh, Abby was here and Jennifer and Liam. Uh, Desiree was here. Ruth was here. Travis was here. Danielle, Corey. So a whole bunch of people here tonight. We really appreciate you guys stopping by and participating. That's why we're doing this video feed as well. We're also getting our YouTube channel up and running. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot more video on, in the year to come. Um, I'm coming to you from our mobile studio because in August we're planning on doing a road trip. Uh, and I, I guess it's uh, the HRN Roadshow 2021 was the name that was voted on by the auditors. So it's HRN Roadshow. We're getting the logo made now and we're going to go for a month on the road in this in this here uh, RV <laughs> that we have here. And we're going to be staying at people's farms or at listeners farms all across the we're going to be east of the Mississippi th this year and west next year. Uh, but the goal is to stay at farms <laughs> and to visit farms and ride horses and play with ponies and uh, do some videos. And I'm practicing with my drone now so we can add drone footage to them and scare the horses half to death because I'm not very good at flying the drone. Um, we're going to see how many horses we can take out on the East Coast. Uh, but it's going to be a lot of fun. So that's why uh, that's why we're we're practicing here tonight, actually, from the mobile studio. And it seemed to hold up well, except for Dis Disney's Internet at one point. So that's that's really it pretty well. Numbers. That's right. Yeah. So, and thank you to Robin over here at Disney World at Fort Wilderness. With uh, she's in charge of the horse program, and she was uh, she was so kind today. Spent about an hour or two with <laughs> us, and we got all caught up about everything. Got to see the new barn, and we'll talk about that on Monday's horses in the morning as well. And we're very excited about the roadshow. That's providing fingers crossed we get our vaccines by then. So we're hoping. Fingers crossed. But we'll hopefully see you all. And we're going to do meetups, too, by the way. So if we're not coming to your farm, we're going to do meetups in each area that we are. The, the, we have a lot of volunteers in different states to set up the meetups. So we'll be going to dinners or we'll be having a picnic or whatever, uh, whatever we can do in that area. So we'll get a bunch of listeners together. You'll get to meet each other. I think it should be a lot of fun. So, And I've been wanting to do this since I started 11,000 episodes ago on the Horse Radio Network. So hope, hopefully we'll get it accomplished this year. We're, we're on our way. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Appreciate it. Of course, I do another show called Horses in the Morning. It is one of the top five longest running daily podcasts in the world. And you can find us at Horses in the Morning. We have shows five days a week. You'll never get bored because there's a ton to listen to. And that's where Christy shows up once a month as well. Thank you all. Happy scooping. Thank you. Good night. Bye, guys. Thanks a bunch. Good night.